Welcome to Artifacts, the show on City Cable 34 in which we talk about the arts. This is going to be a magic show. Stay with us. Welcome everybody, this is Artifacts, and as Phil said, this is where we feature news and views on the arts and artists in the metro area. From visual arts, literature, theater and dance, to music, film and video, and everything in between. Why, on this show alone, we've got dancers, a musician, an arts critic, and a magician. All in one show, it's gonna be, it's gonna be great. I'm Janet Zahn, uh, the coordinator of the Office of Film, Video and Recording for the City of Minneapolis. And I'm Phil Lindsay. I also work for the City of Minneapolis, and we love having people come on here and talk about the arts and related issues. So we'll be back right after we take a look at a clip from the Bravo Network. They came to town recently and did what they call an arts break about the Minneapolis area. So we'll take a look at that and come right back with our first guest from the Ethnic Dance Theater. Minneapolis, St. Paul, is like the fourth largest cultural and arts center in the United States. People don't know that. They think about Minneapolis and St. Paul and think this is some winter, you know, tundra where everybody freezes to death and stays inside all winter long, and that's just not the case. Hi, I'm Suzette Charles for Bravo's Arts Break. Today we're visiting the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, a metro area with a world-renowned symphony, art museum, and theater company. The Minnesota Orchestra played host to Bravo for a special concert featuring AGOA, the orchestra's musical director, designate. And that was a clip from the Bravo Arts Break, and later on in this show we'll see another clip from it. I really just wanted folks that are viewing this show to have a chance to see a little bit of what they came to town to do, and we might talk about that, uh, that piece that they did a little bit later. And now I have two wonderful people as guests who are wonderfully costumed. They're from the Ethnic Dance Theater. We have Jonathan Fry, who is an artistic director there, and Julia Weiler, who's a dancer there and has danced in other ensembles over the years. So welcome. Thank you for joining us on the it's show. It's great to be here. Thanks. Nice to have you nice here. To be here. And before we go on and learn a little bit more about the Ethnic Dance Theater, which is a venerable institution now here in the Twin Cities, let's talk about these costumes, which are just knockout. Why don't we start here? And I guessed right, but I'm not sure I have the right pronunciation. It's an Uzbeki costume? Yes. From what people right. would call Uzbekistan. Right. Okay. Right. right. Tell us what you're wearing. From, uh, this was a very old dance that was done in the courts of the Emir. And uh, so it's very colorful and elaborate. And the crown, of course, with the golden brow oh, across okay. here. And the name of the golden brow They is call it Tiliakosh in the Uzbek language. It means golden brows. And it's a sign of, of beauty. In that culture, they often will draw their eyebrows together as well, something that we find unusual because in our culture, we pull the hairs out that are between yeah, our eyebrows. Be that. But they right, like to draw right. them together. Right, and, and with the way those dangle, I don't know if mm -hmm. the cameras can get in close enough, but there, there's movement there as well as the color and the sparkle and then this wonderful uh, motley right. of color here. Not and I see you that, braided your hair for braids. this show. Oh, I did. I made six braids, <laughs> as a matter of fact. So, That's great. And yeah. this is an actual costume that you wear while performing right, that particular right, dance? Right, right. And even though it is not ancient in its actual age, it comes from costumes that were produced, uh, or dress that was produced thousand years ago. Yes, it's very old. The, the fabrics itself and the jewelry did come from Uzbekistan. That material is silk. And oh, yeah, this actual, it's wow. a silk charmeuse type mm -hmm. fabric. And when, when you purchase it, it's interesting because it comes in only 24 or 26 inch widths, so you need many, many yards to make a garment. And because these people are Islamic, she has trousers on underneath as well. Do you actually? Yes. Yeah, that oh, match. amazing. Yeah. And that's part of that cultural tradition. That's right. right. I mean, understanding. Right. And I see you brought your handcraft to uh, Uzbeki shoes. My red shoes, of there course. We go. Must Always. have red shoes. Yes. That's good. Yes. And yes. Jonathan, what are you wearing that looks Eastern European? Oh, it's very, very typical Eastern European shape. This costume came from the villages that are around Zagreb, the capital of Croatia. And I purchased this on my first trip to Europe in 1970, which is why I wore it today to kind of celebrate the fact that 
we've been around for 20 years now. You sure have. Right, and it's all handmade, hand-woven linens. The coat was typically decorated by tailors in the village, but the fabric was all hand-pressed wool made at home. So and all the finishing this touches done detail by hand. is really done by, by hand. Right, right. The fabrics are all hand-woven. Very impressive. Very impressive. Thank you. And I must say, they both look comfortable in which to dance, which must be They're a They're suited to the dancing yeah. that they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you bought that for yourself. Was this made for you, your particular costume? Yes. Yes. Okay. These were all made for the women. Okay. So costuming okay. is a big part of the ethnic dance theater. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Serious um, research goes into And John is our real expert or authority. It's been a real point of interest for me, as much as the dancing and the folklore and the culture for years. But the costumes have always been... It's such an illustration of what the cultures are like and the people are like, and I've always liked historical fashion, and even when I was a little kid, I'd, my parents would find me pouring through encyclopedias and National Geographics looking at this, and they thought, well, we'll have to find something for this that will line up, I'll fall into alignment with this kid, you know, so yeah. he can fulfill his interests. And then sure enough, eventually I discovered folk dance. <laughs> well, now you mentioned in 1970 you went off to Europe and you, you knew you wanted this, and then uh, just a couple years later, you and a partner founded the Ethnic Dance Theater. In 1974, right. yes, we founded the Ethnic Dance Theater, Donald LaCourse and myself. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now, for those who don't know, and I'm sure some people that are watching are, are unfamiliar with the Ethnic Dance Theater, mm -hmm. what is it, what's your mission, and where do you display all this wonderful uh, raiment and uh, the, the dancing? Well, our mission is to foster understanding and awareness of world cultures through music, dance, and the arts okay. of those particular cultures. And that's what we endeavor to do, primarily with our performing. Um, we perform here in the Twin Cities. Our major concerts are at O'Shaughnessy in the spring and part of Zomerfest in the summer here in Minneapolis. And um, we also have a young audience group that works in the schools demonstrating, performing, working with the kids. So there's an educational aspect of the company. And the choir just did a concert at Landmark Center back in May. So we're pretty active around here, and we also tour. Wow. And it's a large ensemble. Yes. In a few minutes, we're going to see a clip that you're kind enough to bring. Great. And in any given uh, production number or dance, there are a lot of you there. How big is the ensemble How well, at any one time? The full company is about 45 artists right now, so that would make around 26 dancers, 8 musicians, and 8 to 10 uh, vocalists. Wow. I, I think a, a number of folks who may be familiar with the dance theater are unaware that chor the choral aspect is important as well. It's all integrated yeah. into our programming and all of the music. We have a wonderful group of musicians that I just thank my lucky stars for that are well versed in many different folk instruments and play a lot of musical styles and they're the backbone of our concerts. The music is all live for both dance and, and song. Yeah, and there are enough people here in the Minneapolis Twin Cities area to fill out your, your dancing roster and your musical ensembles and all that. I mean, We seem to have good turnout when we, we have auditions annually and we, have, we always seem to find when we need to replace folks, we always seem to have a wonderful turnouts and so... How do you choose the dances, uh, how do you, where do you go and find those, mm -hmm. or what, what, when you set a season, I guess, you probably decide you're going to do uh -huh. a handful of different dances. We've, so we often will plan ideas out three years in advance and then take a look at what's realistic according to what the personnel is, what the instrumentalists, what the skill of the dance corps is like, and what, what we can realistically uh, approach at a time. So that's why a long range planning is really necessary. Um, we take a look at what's needed variety wise, what we're interested in, and what we feel is a relevant thing, uh, art form to show at the time. And all those are, are components that go into making choices. And then it you often involves research trips or bringing in teachers from, from abroad, which means you have to write grants and proposals. And then, uh. So it's really a long range thing. You have to have costumes ordered and built over there. And instruments have to be made very often. And no, so it's an elaborate thing to get a work together. That's one of the real values of ethnic dance theater, I think, is its authenticity when it comes to styling of dance, mm -hmm. when it comes to costuming. Um, all these things contribute to presenting an authentic piece, but it's kind of difficult for the dancers who are attempting to dance in the styles of many different cultures and learn that piece um, maybe within just a few short months even um, and mm -hmm. having people come from other cultures and, and these other styles to actually yeah. teach them are very, very helpful. Um, but that's, uh, that's one of the challenges of the group, too. There are a lot of, 
I think, ethnic groups in the Twin Cities that, that focus just on one particular culture. But uh, trying to do the whole scope of it is well, a challenge. The concerts I've seen that you've done, I mean, it's uh, worldwide. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen right. some from the Far East as well as Eastern Europe and, mm -hmm. and America. You've done mm -hmm. some from, from these shores as well. As yes. well. Mm -hmm. um, well. There are more questions I want to ask, but I wondered if we could maybe see the tape you were nice enough okay. to bring. And maybe you could just set us up for a moment. What is it we're about to see? This is a recent production? It's a recent. This is from the spring concerts at the end of March at O'Shaughnessy to, as a kickoff to our 20-year anniversary celebration. And this work is choreographed by the now current artistic director for the Hungarian State Ensemble. It comes from a village called Vida Kamarash in Transylvania. So they're Hungarian people living in Transylvania. It was probably one of the most long-term undertakings that we have worked on for a long time. It's a great deal of satisfaction is derived from this piece when you see it. I think and the name of it is? Why. Vida Kamarashi Kansuk. Okay, here it is. Take a look. that as a <laughs> said it was a birthday party on Mars and I'm still scratching my head over <laughs> that comment because it doesn't appear to be Martian at all to I me. Didn't it's see in a cake, so I don't know what that was. <laughs> um, now that was where at O'Shaughnessy? Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any favorite venues? Uh, I I've often thought for a long time that w in the Twin Cities we don't have an excellent dance space. We have a lot of good ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the nature of what you do which needs a lot of space, mm -hmm. um, you know, a full stage house. The Are favorite. there any favorite places for you? Yeah, I think the favorite place for the company, and this is what I sort of learned later on, was O'Shaughnessy, because it's yeah. an intimate theater, mm. so that people can be close enough to get the feel and the essence of the dances, and um, not be so far away, yet it's big enough to... Um, get everybody what, out yeah, there. to get everybody out to. there, right. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that is, we all, we all really do enjoy, the only thing we don't love about O'Shaughnessy is the floor is a little bit unforgiving on the feet, but you get used to it and we know that it's, otherwise it's so ideal for, for showcasing the company. Yeah. We love Orchestra Hall as well. It's, yeah. we don't have as much magic with lighting there because it's not that type of It's not facility. set up for that. Yeah. But I love yeah. it. I mean, and, and yeah. we have a wonderful success every year. It's been 10 years now that we've been appearing at Summerfest. Well, great segue because this month, uh, July, you right. folks are going to be part of Summerfest again. Can you right. give us a, a little preview of what we'd see over there? Uh, what, sure. What the program is? Sure. The, the, the date is July 17th. It's a Sunday evening at 7. And what's on the menu for that night is a piece from, sen from the Bucharest area of Romania. It's a very exciting electric piece. Uh, singers are doing a wedding ritual from central Russia. We have a di a, the Uzbeki Uzbek and Tajiki sweet. dances from Central Asia, we call them dances of the Silk Route. Um, a dance from Bosnia called uh, Kolo is Glamocha, it's a dance without music, it's a little bit somber and heavy but interesting, very interesting. Uh, these dances from Transylvania that you just saw. Mm -hmm. We have a dance of the red silk ribbons from China. A uh, suite from northern Mexico, the Fiesta Norteña. We have also a, a wonderful finale, I just it's very nostalgic for some of us that have been around all these years. It's from the Appalachian Americans. It takes place during Depression America at a barn dance. So oh, what a, what a wonderful program. Right, right. You know, it's right back home. Our time is virtually up, and I wanted to ask you other serious issues, like uh, 
when you bring in dances from parts of the world that are, are so troubled, if, if that's a special issue for you folks? Well, what, it can be. That's, a, that's an interesting thing to ask because you get really invested in the culture when you start you pursuing it. So you mm -hmm. care about it, you start cooking the foods. Usually if you've worked with people over there, you have yeah. some kind of a kinship. I don't want to be th think of things in terms of politics, but I do think it's really wonderful when the world is blurring its identities and things are so out of control to provide a little bit of international sanity and show them some of the most positive aspects of their tradition, and that's the folk art. Sounds like a good mission. I want to thank you both for being on. Uh, look forward to seeing you at Zummerfest. Thank you. Jonathan, thanks. Thanks. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Julia, nice to, nice to, to see here. you. Thanks a lot. And we'll be back in just a moment. Actually, Janet will be back with uh, Willie Wisely to talk about the Icebreaker 94. But uh, stay tuned for this. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Janet Zahn, and with me today is Mr. Willie Wisely. Hello, Janet. Hi. Thanks for coming over. Uh, you're welcome. Willie is a musician first, I think, with the Willie Wisely Trio, and you also work at First Avenue, and you are the president of the Minnesota Music Academy. That is correct. Pretty impressive. Pretty <laughs> impressive. Um, Pretty busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just crazy. Tell me about, um, just for people who don't know about the Minnesota Music Academy, what is it and what is their mission in life? The Music Academy was founded in 1985 to more judiciously administer the Minnesota Music Awards, mm -hmm. which had been going on uh, at, uh, in the City Pages uh, uh, magazine for some time. The, uh, uh, the board got together and found it a, a, f a fair way to vote and a large voting college and it, it soon became apparent that a mission of equal importance might be to help educate musicians about the business of music mm -hmm. and uh, consequently we began a, a program of, of seminars and workshops mm -hmm. um, that blossom, it blossomed into a full-fledged event uh, called Icebreaker which happens every summer mm -hmm. um, that includes showcases, seminars, and, uh, and of course the Minnesota Music Awards party. Mm -hmm. And this year, Icebreaker, and from my estimation, is really back as a, just a really uh, wonderful, action-packed three days. <laughs> you got a lot of stuff going, and I thought, because there's so much good stuff happening, I want to make sure people know what this is all about and what it is that you're doing. So I thought we could kind of just go through the days. It's starting on Thursday, July 7th. That is correct. And if I were going to go to this thing, the first uh, thing I'd want to do, I believe, is buy a laminate, correct? Yeah, that's right. Well, we have uh, dozens of events, mm -hmm. and what we've done is make them all free to those folks that have a laminate. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, people that are nominated for awards uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and stuff automatically get one, and mm -hmm. they're on sale to the general public mm -hmm. for a mere $11. Mm -hmm. And this gets you into the whole deal, three the days worth of stuff. The whole shaboo, yeah, the, you know, well over $100 worth of uh, mm -hmm. the cover charges at bars and stuff. Mm -hmm. You could see hundreds of bands and, well, over a hundred bands and mm -hmm. over a dozen showcases. And, mm -hmm. and for 11 bucks. All for $11. Yeah. And it buys you a membership to the Minnesota Music Academy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which allows you to vote. Mm -hmm. yeah. And get the newsletter and you'll be more aware of all that stuff that you're that doing. That is correct. Okay. And where do you get the laminates? Laminates are available um, starting <clears throat> at the end of this week, which is roughly June... Oh, what date is it? Oh, about the 20, <laughs> 25th, about June know. 25th. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there we go. I think that's Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, the laminates will go on sale at uh, independent record stores around town, mm -hmm. Northern Lights, Electric Fetus, Garage Door, or Folk Jokopus. Mm -hmm. Let It Be, Roadrunner, Aardvark, um, among others, down, yeah. in, down in the Valley stores. Yeah. So just uh, wherever you're buying music. Uh, yes, at mm -hmm. the in indie record stores. Mm -hmm, yes. mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, Thursday night, the 7th, big show at First Avenue. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Doc Severance and Headlines, the mm -hmm. Minnesota Music Awards party, mm -hmm. uh, the awards ceremony at First Avenue. Mm -hmm. And this is where we reveal the winners. Uh, the votes are in, and the, the nominating committee has... Uh, uh, 
uh, produce their secret report, so mm -hmm. I, I guess we know who won already, mm -hmm. and it's just a matter of presenting it at the awards party on the 7th. And these are four accomplishments by local musicians in the 1993 year. Mm, lots of different categories. Tons of different categories. 50 different categories, uh, including uh, film and video, mm -hmm. and uh, in music-related shows, but also uh, awards for single, uh, you know, instruments and players of instruments, and uh, then awards to you know best bands, best artists, you sure. know, and different categories of music as mm -hmm. well. And your host for the evening, besides Doc, is yeah, Doc Severin and headlines, but mm -hmm. uh, Liz Winstead, uh, uh, our favorite hometown comedian mm -hmm. of HBO and Comedy Channel fame, is uh, going to MC the event, mm -hmm. and um, uh, she's going to usher everybody on and off of stage, and there will be tons of uh, local celebrities doing uh, award presentations and fun stuff like that, and there's going to be a whole lineup of local players um, playing with Doc Severinsen will be Captain Jack McDuff. Uh, we're proud to have him as a resident of Minnesota, a, a luminary jazz figure. And, uh, uh, but also Jelly Bean Johnson and a, and a band of, of his cohorts will be ending the evening, as well as performances by Cherokee Rose, a country and western uh, oriented group and um, Red Red Groovy, a techno dance oriented group, and, and many others, and possibly other large stars. I, there's a chance that uh, um, Sounds of Blackness are going to perform, and so I'm waiting for that Keeping confirmation. Keeping your fingers crossed. Oh, I hope they can. Yeah, yeah. There's a, also, just want to mention briefly, there's kind of this fun thing that you do called the Found Art, Art Awards for the people that win Minnesota Music Awards. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Uh, the Found Art Awards are something that was uh, thought up at a meeting where everyone was just bored of buying, <laughs> going to the trophy store. No one wanted to go to the trophy <laughs> store and buy 50 awards for each category. <laughs> And uh, we just figured the best way to do it would be to be creative, to get perhaps some kids in involved or something like that. Well, last year we had students make the awards, and that was real cute. This year we had an artist come to us, Bill Slack, a local artist, and he said he wanted to make a piece of art out of uh, found contributions from the people that were not musicians that were nominated for awards. So all our nominees, most of them sent back pieces of found uh, hubris, <laughs> uh, if that's a word. And uh, uh, he is going to make a collage piece out of it and then cut that collage piece into 50 units. And each one will be given away as a separate award to a winner in an individual um, uh, category. Yeah, unique awards and a fun award ceremony. Boy, it really sounds fun. And again, what a deal for 11 bucks. I mean, even if you just went to this thing. Yeah. The, the you just don't see that kind of talent for that kind of money. No kidding. It yeah. will be a lot of fun and very star-studded if mm -hmm. you're into that. But more than anything, it's just acknowledging a vibrant and vast uh, statewide music scene. I mean, it's, it's compelling. With my musical group, I'm able to tour the nation. And things like this don't don't happen in every state. They mm -hmm. don't, you know, they, they, no way. They happen on the coasts, you know. Right. We live in a unique environment right. artistically. <sighs> Friday and Saturday, the, the fun continues. Um, Saturday, uh, Friday night first. Mm -hmm. What's going on? That's showcase night, mostly. Yes, showcases begin on Friday and continue through Saturday. And that's uh, depending on what night it is. It's seven to nine uh, venues located, I think, entirely in Minneapolis, where the MMA is going to run shuttles to and fro, back and forth to, to each venue, uh, shuttling people around that have laminates. Mm -hmm. the laminates get you in for free. They get you on the shuttle for free. And you can bar hop all night, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. I guess you can bar hop all night long and see as many bands as you can possibly cram in mm -hmm. to Minnesota, one evening. Minnesota musicians. And the bars have cooperated graciously and booked only local talent. And it's, uh, that should just be a gas. Mm -hmm. And for someone like uh, myself who has trouble getting out to see all the music I should, mm -hmm. um, it'll be a great fun night to just soak in a lot of music. Yeah, and then Saturday, the showcases continue, continue. Saturday night also, but you have um, some good seminars Saturday afternoon? Yes, um, as part of our educational priority, the M Minnesota Music Academy, the MMA, uh, stages a, an afternoon of seminars, always in conjunction with the icebreaker festivities. Um, this year, they are occurring at the downtown Hilton in Minneapolis, the new hotel. And uh, I don't have a room number on that yet, but mm -hmm. there's three seminars. One is um, care and use of the voice, 
and the Voice Center will be making a presentation. They'll use a video uh, presentation of um, vocal cords actually working, mm -hmm. which is uh, at best, a disgusting <laughs> maneuver <laughs> to watch. Um, and they'll show defective <laughs> vocal cords. It's very interesting. Yeah. And then there will be a panel discussion with local singers, people that use their voices in different ways, including a ra radio disc jockey, a commercial singer, and a hard rock singer, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then the second of the three seminars will be uh, what's it called? The State of Rock Criticism in the Age of MTV. Uh, you know, is mm -hmm. rock criticism, is, I'm sorry, music criticism, is it a dead art? Mm -hmm. the thir and that'll feature local uh, writers. And the third and uh, final seminar will be um, uh, indie labels, the land of 10,000 indie <laughs> labels. There are a lot of independent record labels in this town mm -hmm. uh, that are giving birth to a lot of the talent of tomorrow, and it's always worthwhile to hear these business people talk about what they go through. Mm -hmm. There's one last, not, it's a workshop um, called the Demo Demolition. Mm -hmm. The venue changes for that and by now we're at 6 o'clock and that will be on Saturday the 9th again, but it'll be at First Avenue. And the Demo Demolition is where we get a panel of experts, you know, <laughs> publishers, yeah. radio people, sure. uh, this sort of thing, and we People pay $5 to submit their cassette, and it's publicly listened to, and then mm -hmm. the panel remarks on it, um, feeds them comments about how they could grow, how they could change, mm -hmm. whatever. Sometimes it's very general, sometimes it's very specific, and it's very exciting for songwriters. Yeah, yeah. So that's, a whole, that's eight hours of seminars on Saturday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then everybody goes out, has a great time going to the showcases, and then there's a party at the end of it all. That's correct. Um, the Oh, you know what? We should step backwards because mm -hmm. also on Saturday oh, afternoon yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. is the, uh, outdoor, outdoor, the outdoor Festival at the Roadhouse, which is a bar on South Washington um, near, the, uh, near, the, near Highway 35. And we're going to have an outdoor eight-hour long festival uh, featuring all local acts again. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's free with a laminate. Whew. Wow. Yep. Good deal. Yeah, and then the, that night. I'm sorry. I That's feel like okay. I'm rambling, but no. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot to ramble about. That's this is the whole purpose is because I just think that you have done such a great job pulling this whole thing together. There's not. I mean, like you say, this is people take it for granted here a bit that you know that we have all this music here and we have these great bands. We got you know and and such a variety and wealth of talent. Mm -hmm. And it, it just ain't so in no. every other city. No, no. Yeah. And to try and get all these promoters and all these talented musicians <laughs> to cooperate is another <laughs> That's right. act of Congress. Um, and uh, yeah. the act of Congress will culminate in the closing party mm -hmm. for Icebreaker 94, which will be at Metro Studios uh, starting at midnight. Oh, late. On, on Saturday. <laughs> and we'll see you there, yeah, right, we, Janet? I'll, I'll be there <laughs> with bells on. With your eyes propped open. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is... Again, like I say, a tremendous lineup, and I appreciate you for being here talking about it and for doing the deal because I know you're the uh, you're the leader of this whole pack, and well, you're doing somehow. a great job. Yeah. I hope that people can uh, go out to the record stores and purchase laminates. They're yep. eleven dollars, and you get a free membership with the MMA, and you get uh, hundreds of dollars worth of activities this weekend and year round through mm -hmm. through other concert events that we throw all year round. Yeah, it's quite a deal, and uh, check the record stores, please. Yeah, and City Pages too for all the uh, bands and venues. Yep, City Pages will have uh, information the next two weeks running. Yep, great. Well, again, Minnesota Music Academy's Icebreaker 94, July 7th through the 9th. And coming up next, Phil talks with critic Roy Close right after this clip from Bravo. We pride ourselves in the Twin Cities as being a progressive community, for, for whatever that means. I, as a conservative mayor, I say that we're, we're progressive. I think progressive in, in, in challenging who we are and what we're all about and, and who better to do that than, than, than artists in the arts community. Our next stop is with the Children's Theatre Company in Minneapolis during their production of Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Next we walked across the lobby to see the world-class collection at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. It can't just be the Guthrie Theatre, the Walker, or the Minneapolis Orchestra. Those are important and critical, but as well we must reach the artists at the grassroots level and give them an opportunity to draw people in um, at the neighborhood. We at Bravo hope you've enjoyed this brief tour of some of the arts organizations which make the Twin Cities such an enjoyable place to live. Thanks for joining us. I'm Suzette Charles.
And that was another look at uh, part of the arts break from the Bravo Network, and we're very glad that they came to town to do that. And I, in particular, was uh, interested in what uh, the two mayors of St. Paul, Minneapolis had to say. So if you get a chance to see that in its entirety, please do. My next guest is Roy Close, who is a uh, freelance writer, uh, a critic, who's held positions with uh, at least a couple of the major dailies here in mm -hmm. town, and the recent author of uh, what I consider an important book, uh, important and informative, um, Critical Conditions, uh, Arts Criticism in Minnesota in the 90s, which was, is it the right way to say it, commissioned by the uh, Center for Arts Criticism? It was commissioned by the Center for Arts Criticism, and they approached me to, to write it. And they approached me, I think, because I had been at, as you say, I worked at the Minneapolis Star throughout the 1970s, and I worked at the St. Paul Pioneer Press uh, pretty much throughout the 80s. And uh, so they, and I've also been involved with the Center for Arts Criticism since its inception. I was on their board of directors for six years, and I was their president for four years. And, and there I was unemployed, and they needed somebody to, to uh, do this book. So they approached me and asked me if I would be willing to write it, and, and uh, I did. Sounds like a great fit. Mm -hmm. yes, um, it was. Before we go on to some of the uh, insight that you put into the book, um, quick working definition of what we mean by criticism. Well, in, in the, the book, I refer to criticism as uh, the act of making uh, public judgments, evaluations uh, about the arts and entertainment. Uh, I, I sometimes use, use a, an even simpler definition, which is to say it's, it's informed comment. And uh, I, tr I try not to be too, too uh, fancy about it. I, yeah. I think anybody can be a critic, and, and mm -hmm. it's not something that requires uh, special expertise. It's not something that, that you have to go to s school for um, 100 years to, to become. Uh, people are critics because uh, they, they have opinions, they know something about the, the, what, what they're talking about, and they're willing to express them. And of course, somebody's willing to pay them for that, it. And that helps a lot. That helps right. a great deal. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in a little bit, we're going to take a look at uh, a roll-in that our crew did on uh, some some of the format at the Star Tribune in mm -hmm. particular. But of course, there's a, a much broader context in which criticism goes on. I mean, there's the print media and the electronic media. Correct. And as you outline in the book, there are a lot of issues involved. And of course, there's Greater Minnesota. I want to touch on a lot of those mm -hmm. subjects. Sure. Can you talk with us a little bit about the current conditions of arts criticism, cultural criticism? I think that there there are a number of things happening. But, but the, the main thing that is happening, and, and it seems to me the the, the most alarming trend really is, is that the daily newspapers in, in the Twin Cities, that's the, in the Pioneer Press in St. Paul and the Star Tribune in Minneapolis, are, are really changing the, the nature of their coverage. There's less emphasis on uh, the fine arts, the traditional fine arts, and there's a lot more emphasis on entertainment, uh, particularly movies, uh, television, and uh, popular music. Uh, this is, of course, a reflection of the fact that that's what, what uh, today's younger readers are interested in primarily. Um, the, the Minnesota Orchestra, for example, is having a great deal of trouble getting young people to, mm -hmm. to come to their concerts. And that's reflected in, in the fact that, that the young people who are uh, reading the, the Star Tribune or the Pioneer Press are less interested in, in uh, Minnesota Orchestra criticism than ever before. So in a sense, the newspapers are, are, are following the trend of, of what's happening in the, in the arts community uh, at large. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a very disturbing situation in terms of, of, of arts organizations because, uh, in essence, they are being relegated more and more to a corner. They're yeah, marginalized, in, I, in a I, sense. That, that is, in fact, a term that the critics have used to describe what they see, yeah. see their situation. Well, well, so, so the working critics, including yourself then, uh, must have some feelings about this. After all, it's your profession. Oh, yeah. Well, it was, it was sufficient uh, for me to, to you know, it was one of the reasons I decided to leave the profession as a, as a full-time profession. I, I just really couldn't see myself you know, getting old at the St. Paul Pioneer Press writing reviews that you know, went from 16 column inches to 14 column inches to 12 column inches and so forth until basically I was writing USA Today kinds of reviews of uh, 6 to 8 column inches. Mm -hmm. I had no desire to do that and, and I felt that you really couldn't deal with, with the art. Uh, what's happening of course is, is that the reviews uh, at those papers are, are, are becoming more and more uh, consumer columns and mm -hmm. so 
uh, this, what I call the Siskel Ebert influence. Yeah, the it, thumbs up. Every, everybody thumbs down is, is kind being, of thing. being invited to do a thumbs up, yeah. thumbs down. And, and uh, there's been a lot of pressure, for example, at the Pioneer Press to get all of the critics, not just the movie critic, to, to put stars on, on the ratings. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's kind of like a hotel guide yes, or something. Yes, exactly right. Uh, the, the idea being that, that the readers don't have as much time uh, as they used to have or as much inclination to read, say, a, a 20 or a 25 column inch review. Mm -hmm. And so you give them the stars, and, and that way they don't really have to read the review at all. Quick fix? Just, yeah, wow. precisely. The trouble with that, it seems to me, and, and the point that I've tried to make in the book, is that you really end up not having uh, in-depth writing about the arts. And if you think that the arts are important in, in the life of the community, uh, you want to have, have your critics doing things like writing uh, column say, you know, who should the next artistic director of the Guthrie be? What kind of person should it be? Is it time that they, they considered a woman, and why? Is it time that, that, that they said, we, we, we're really going to look at a person uh, of color to be the artistic director? Uh, th those are issues that, that really need to be discussed, and there's no better place to discuss them than, than in the uh, daily I would newspapers. agree. No better place there, but given the fact that that isn't happening in, in the, the mass media, right. are those questions being examined anywhere? They, I mean, other than maybe a boardroom somewhere, hopefully? Um, they are being examined in... in in alternative media, I think, but, but not to the extent that, that one would like. Uh, one of the things I discovered as I was doing the research on this book was that the, there's an amazing amount of, of interest in, in arts and entertainment coverage, and it's, it's appearing all over the place. You, you see it in, uh, in uh, uh, some of the ethnic publications, for example, which are weeklies and bi-weeklies, and some of them are monthlies, but things like La Prensa, and uh, Asian American Pages and uh, Insight News, which recently started its own arts and entertainment section, right. which goes out every week. And, and so, so the ethnic press is beginning to be very much more interested in the arts and entertainment than it, than it used to be, it seems to me. Uh, I discovered that there was uh, quite an interest in, uh, in greater Minnesota. And there were was, there was some very pleasant surprises there. The, the newspaper in Fargo, which serves the Moorhead area, which uh, has, has expanded its arts and entertainment coverage. There's a wonderful example of a, of a newspaper in Red Wing, Minnesota, the Republican Eagle, that does a, does a good job in its own turf of covering things at the Sheldon Auditorium and, and, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, at Mystic, not Mystic Lake, what's the casino uh, down the, there? The, yeah, yeah. Uh, Prairie Island, I think. Uh, or something I, like I that. Yeah. So, um, so they, you know, they do a good job. And um, it's Treasure Island. <laughs> Treasure Island, yeah, the other one's got yeah, right. yeah, other problems. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so there, there are alternative things. This program is, 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 a, is a perfect example of the kind of thing that, that is beginning to appear. Uh, uh, there's, there's really not enough uh, uh, arts coverage, it seems to me, on, on commercial television. But on non-commercial television, non-commercial radio, you're beginning mm -hmm. to see uh, and I'm surprised at how programs. little is on the electronic media. There really isn't as much as... as Considering as the immediacy for audiences exactly right. and if, if that timeliness and right. that uh, urgency is important. So, so much of, of, of what appears in the newspapers and what appears on television and even I, I think what you hear on radio is determined by the numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had, had some interesting conversations with the folks at, at uh, um, KTCA, uh, Minnesota mm -hmm. uh, Public Television. Uh, and, and even though they're a nonprofit and, and television uh, uh, outlet, they too are concerned with the numbers. And, and there is sort of a, a bottom line beyond they're which... They're fighting to, yeah. for that existence. Too. E exactly. Let's uh, ask our crew to put on uh, the, the overview we took of some of the features in the arts and entertainment section of the Star Tribune. Okay. And then as we look at that, maybe you could comment a little bit on mm -hmm. what it is, in your opinion, they're trying to do and what your thoughts about some of those are. Okay. I know you're not shy about your opinions. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Um, front page mm -hmm. the, of the arts and entertainment section, mm -hmm. which used to be called the arts and entertainment section, but is now just called entertainment. They dropped the word arts because a focus group told them that the, the term arts was too snooty. And so they decided not to have, you see, oh, arts, yeah, is, arts is down below now and entertainment is the big word at the top. And there's Streisand and uh, well, there's Marianne Feldman, who's mm -hmm. a real character. Local and that's story. a good article on the Minneapolis Institute of Arts and its turn of the century thing, uh, exhibition. Summer Sampler, uh, you know, that's, that's a sort of an expanded calendar listing, uh, fairly typical. Uh, more calendars, more calendar. Mm -hmm. No critical content at all. Really no, and, and Culture 101 is, is sort of, uh, as, as the name suggests, it's a, 
uh, a little bit of, of uh, primer, but you see it's Fred Flintstone and Don Rickles <laughs> and pop music and a little bit of theater there and architecture. But uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a case of sort of popularizing everything to the, and, and not writing, it seems to me, as seriously as they might. And certainly not, well, now we're, of course, we are into uh, to, um, um, book reviews, mm -hmm. and it's nice that they still do book reviews, but... but they looked yeah. awful short. Yeah, right. The book reviews have gotten shorter. Eight Days Out is another big calendar, mm -hmm. more calendar. It's almost a pull-out section of front mm -hmm. and back. Yes. Now, I, I, I would suggest that their, their uh, reader surveys probably indicate that that's what people are most interested in, or that's what most people are more interested in. Mm -hmm. But I'm a critic, and I'm, I'm a consumer of criticism, and that's not what I'm interested in. I, I want informed comment about the arts. I want critics who are uh, knowledgeable, mm -hmm. not only about what's happening here, but mm -hmm. what's happening elsewhere, because of course you can't really uh, talk about what's happening here if you don't have uh, some, some point of comparison. So, That's right. so if, if you never travel, if you never go to Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles, and San Francisco, or for that matter, Kansas City, Cincinnati, uh, Seattle, uh, you never really have a sense of, of how the Guthrie compares to, say, the Seattle Rep and other regional right. companies, how the Minnesota Orchestra compares to the Cleveland Orchestra. Right. So in other words, we stand uh, vulnerable to being insular in, in the long term in one of the worst ways. Yes, and, and the, the, the term I think that, that, that really counts is provincial. provincial. And, and when, when the newspapers sort of are satisfied with doing the calendars and, and, the, uh, and, and doing the review of the Guthrie, this show, and then next week they'll do the re review of the next show at the Guthrie, and then and a month later the next show at the Guthrie. And what, what you so seldom see is, is a, a critic like Mike Steele, who's very knowledgeable, doing a piece that says, all right, here's, here's what the season tells us about the Guthrie. Yes. Um, you know, Mike should be writing a column every Sunday, not the Arts at Large column, which is, which is this long, and, and you know, you, well, they started with boldface, type as though, or a gossip column. They've gotten rid of that now, but, but it's still designed really for, for entry-level uh, arts consumers yeah. and um, not all of us are entry-level uh, arts consumers and there are plenty of people who are, who are serious about, about the arts and if the arts make a difference in, in our quality of life in the Twin Cities somebody needs to treat them seriously. Yeah. And right? if not here the question is where? Yeah exactly yeah. right. We've got about one minute or sure. less left. Uh, hopeful about the future? What's the outlook? Well I'm, I'm I'm never terribly uh, uh, unoptimistic or never terribly pessimistic about the future. Yeah, yeah I, th I think the newspapers remain you know, potentially very, very strong uh, venues for the arts coverage. However, I say in the book, and I, I do think that it's very important for the arts organizations to start taking things into their own hands. If they're serious about having serious criticism, the arts organizations themselves and the arts community itself needs to do something about creating new venues, you know, supporting things like this program, you know, whatever so, it might be. There you have <laughs> Roy Close. <laughs> he's issued the challenge, and he's given you at least a couple of steps to go. Yeah. Roy, thank you very much. My pleasure. I'd like to have Thanks you back on. You. I'd be delighted Keep to come back. Keep updating us on this sort of thing. Good. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. Great. Um, oh, one last question. Yes. How do people get hold of the book? They, they can get it by ordering it from the Center for Arts Criticism, which is located at 2402 University Avenue West in St. Paul. It's also in the St. Paul phone directory. Okay. It's the Center for Arts Criticism. It costs 10 bucks a copy, and it's... Um, for anybody that cares right. about the arts uh, in the Metropolitan Twin Cities area, I really recommend it. It's a good read. Thank you. If nothing else. Now, we'll be That's back... A good, good review, even uh, though it was a short one. <laughs> a short one. It's succinct. That's right. Uh, thank you. Uh, the first review of ever, a review I ever gave. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a, a special guest, Mike, Magical Mystical Michael. He's actually going to do some magical effects right here. But first, we're going to have our short events calendar, so stay tuned. We'll be right back.
So please, when you're watching Artifacts, watch with a paper and pencil. Write down those events and please attend some of these events. They're great here in the Twin Cities. Now, we promised you magic in this show and we've got magic in the form of magical, mystical Michael. This is a guy who's popping up all the time. There he is. Hey. Michael, nice to, to see you. Good to see you again, yes. Boy, this, I, this guy used to kill audiences out at the Renaissance Festival, and then, of course, we, my old act, would come up and we'd have to mop up the pieces. Welcome back to the Twin Cities. I'm, I'm ecstatic to be here. You're, you're static? <laughs> the well, hair's looking good. <laughs> it's one of those hair days. So is that your real name, Michael, I mean? Michael? Yes, oh, okay. I wouldn't make that up. No, <laughs> not a name like that. So now, um, you came to town um, to do the Fringe Festival, mm -hmm. which by the time most people are watching the show is history, but uh, welcome back. Well, it gave me a good excuse to get back. Yeah, had you been back prior to that? Since no, it's been 10 years. Wow. And I've wanted to come back within the last four or five years, but life got in my way. Yeah. It, it happened. You've been busy. Uh, yeah, actually, I've been busy. I've had good points and I had low points. I went through an experimental part of in the mid 80s with my mm -hmm. show and so I wasn't working a lot I was more experimenting and trying new things and so my show I felt the quality of it went down just the taste because there was a lot of new things but from all those times of experimenting this last two years I was working out of a club in the winter upstate New York and it gave me an opportunity to do all that stuff over and over yeah. and that is what this show I just did at the fringe was about that's great. It's, I mean, so new effects you're talking about. Actually, since I've been in the city, probably almost the whole show is new, maybe three quarters new. So Let's do a quick primer. We just talked with Roy Close, who's a, a critic here in town, about Culture 101. <laughs> Let's do a quick uh, primer for people about magic. There's what's called table magic, which is close-up stuff. Close magic. Uh, it's, close magic is, is actually harder to do than stand-up stage stuff yeah because you're right there people are seeing every yeah. move you're making so it's it's tough and that's what i was doing up at that club and actually i got a little better at it because you know over the years i've had a couple of pocket tricks and i pull off a few here and there and they were you know, i always get by with it but when i started doing it all the time i noticed i was not that good at it yeah but then i got better at it from doing it a lot yeah. so i really enjoy doing close-up sure. now uh, i still do more my show is more stand-up small stage yeah. I'm doing something nice, though. I am yeah. floating the person in the audience yeah, now. Yeah. Now, what do they call that? That's, that's a big trick. A big, what do they call that? That's uh, Well, you can call it effect. a lot. You yeah. Know. You're looking for the word illusion, but I'm not going to say You're it. not going to say no. that. Okay. All right. No. What, what motivated you? As a, you grew up where? New York? In New York City. What, what got you? How old were you when you decided you wanted to be a magician? Well, you know, it's interesting. You say, decided. I never decided I wanted to be a magician. Okay. I, in New York, I never really did magic. Every time I would go into a magic shop, which I remember having a little urge about magic, a curiosity, yeah. Yeah. they would sell me like a uh, plastic throw up, loads. Oh, these are great magic tricks. Yeah. And, yeah. and a visible ink. Yeah. You know, so I did that as a youth. I could sell you some of that right now. I bet you could. <laughs> You'll never see it. But actually, I was in Colorado and about yeah. 22 and I saw this magician do something at this college I was working in, in Boulder. And they didn't really do much for me, but I saw him do a, a, a magical thing. And then I saw he was talking. I slid something in his pocket, and that got me. And I said, well, what could he have put in his pocket? And actually, that's what got me involved, because the next couple of days, I went downtown in Boulder, and I bought that trick I saw him do. I was going to ask you, you know, how does somebody learn this stuff? I mean, magicians are rather guarded about their, their craft, their well, art, their talent. It's interesting you say that. Out of, it's a performing art, and it's a secretive performing yeah. art. But it's got the most written information about it. Is that it, right? it not only tells you how to do it, it tells you what to say, what thing is to move, uh, how to think about it, how to look at the audience, how to dress, how to stand. No kidding. I mean, there's incredible details. Well, here, look, let me show you some things. I, I, I brought you my magic books, all right? Are you a magic book? No, I'm not, I'm not a magician, right. though. Okay, now this is, this is strictly for amateurs, which is kind of the league I'm in, so you probably don't even look at that 131 magic tricks for amateurs. Yeah. Will Dexter. Is that a name? Yeah, I've heard yeah. of him. Okay. It's like it's got the illustration, but it doesn't tell you what to wear or anything like that. Now this, this here is the magic book. <laughs> He's laughing. He's <laughs> laughing. See? I love it. Yeah, do you? It's nice, lurid. It's like a cover. circus. Yeah. Well, sideshow, you know. Okay. Now inside here, I'll have you know, I found. This, I don't know how this got in here. It was like magic. This is a list of some of the illusions. No bad word. The effects that the you effects. can actually go out and you can buy. Here are the prices here. That's right. But look so at this, those prices. Well, this is probably an ought seven yeah. price list here. You know, fifty bucks. Is that something you're going to experiment to see if you want it, or you want to buy, spend fifty dollars and know a secret? Yeah. See there. Yeah. See effects and stuff cost money. 
If yeah. they didn't, everybody would yeah. be more interested. Everybody would be doing but, it. But, you know, in reality, there's libraries. And you go to a library and learn a whole lot. Serious. But it's also effort. That yeah. means you have to take time out of your day and do yeah. it. Yeah. And so more people would like to come up to me and say, well, how does this work? And they want to hear an answer. Yeah. And that's very simple. Yeah. And that, to me, is why no one tells anyone. It's, it's, yeah. it's, if you, yeah. Anything you want to know, you can know. Yeah. We're in that kind of a world today. Yeah. Um, you're going to show us some effects. Let's start with one right now. Okay. I'll show you something. I'll clear the decks. I'll show you uh, one of my little close things yeah. if I could do it. I'm going to do something yeah. with some coins since everybody knows about coins. Mm -hmm. These are actually older coins. These are all from the 1945s. They're walking liberties. From the 1945s, you say? From 1945, yeah. yeah. Right. This is when our country invested in our country. <laughs> what a concept. Huh? Wow. I don't think I'm old enough to remember that. Well, I'm not. No, but, uh, I remember the silver coins in my yeah. life, though. In the 60s, it's kind of, 64 was the last yeah. year of silver quarters. Yeah. So you know that. A right. nostalgia. Hey, a little warm-up to get the coin warmed up. Watch this. This is just close stuff. This one's for you. You ready? All right. Oh, I lied. It was for me. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Really. I want to show you something else now. Here's a little cup. You can check it out. It's mm -hmm. my Uncle Louis. Yeah, I think his fingerprints are on mm -hmm. there. May rest in peace. Uncle Louis at night used to soak his uh, eyeball. Here yeah, we used to shake it around and go, here's looking at you, Louis. <laughs> One day it fell out in an olive bowl. Boy, was it tough finding the right olive. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use four. <laughs> you had to think about that one. I did. I'm going to use four coins. I'm going to use Uncle Louis' cup. Watch this. Watch this. Yeah. You didn't check the bottom out. Well, that's amazing. You got one, two, three left. You got to watch this. Watch this. Behind my back. That was a rib shot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whoa. A rib shot. Okay, now I got two coins left. I'm going to put one coin here, another coin here. Now watch this. This is going up my sleeve. Watch. It goes up my sleeve. Watch this. It goes up to my shoulder. Yeah. If I miss my shoulder, it falls down my back into my sneaker. Watch the mic cord now. I know. I'm not wearing underwear. Oh, That's why. Right. Now watch. Down and then in. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Okay. It got stuck on my watch. I hate when that happens. Yeah. You know, you know I did go out <laughs> and I bought a bandless watch. A just, for that, watch? just for that effect. It made the trick really smooth. Nice. <laughs> I lost the watch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go figure. The last coin. The last coin's real different now. The last coin goes on top of my head. Gotta watch. Watch this. Okay. Where's that cup? Let's see if I can do this. There's all four of them. Here. <laughs> Hey, nice shooting, Phil. I, I felt that, the weight, and suddenly they were going into the cup. See, that's great. Anyone can do it. And that's real money. That's real money. That's great. You could actually probably get more than 50 cents out of this one. Yeah, a couple, couple coffee there. That's right. That's great. Thank you. Oh, no Wonderful. problem. And later on, you're going to do another one, which is kind of a new it's, it's kind of It's kind of new. I, yeah. I performed it at the Fringe. Yeah? And, yeah. And uh, yeah. I like it. I haven't really done a lot to know of other people hey, like speaking it. of... Uh, Effects. And what, what's, what's the term of uh, Illusion's not the right term? It could be. Yeah. I mean, a, a magician that does illusions will be called an illusionist. Oh, okay. I mean, it's a fine word. What do you think about these guys? I don't, we haven't talked this over, but what do you think about these guys who are kind of making a career about giving away the magic trick? I mean, you see them on TV sometimes. Sometimes they're doing stage shows, and they're basically, they'll do something, the audience goes, wow, and they say, ah, it's just this. And then they, they show you how it's done. Is that, well, you know, is that going in the wrong direction for magic? Yes. It's, it's the same thing I told you before. It's, it's, people could know if they put effort out. Yeah. I think it's kind of, I mean, we know so much in this world, living in today's environment and, yeah. and techno, technolo technological age. Yeah. That was a, not an easy one to say. No, I think you have a coin I, in there. And I think it's good not to know. Yeah. It's good because it gives your mind a feeling of expansion, of somewhere to go that you haven't been. And, the, you know, there was someone on TV I saw not too long ago. I don't even know his name. He exposed some magic, but he... he blindfolded himself. Yeah. And I thought that was cheap. If he's yeah. going to do this, why don't he just be who he is? Yeah. And that I didn't like. Um, but people do what they do. Yeah. yeah. I'm with you, though. Uh, we've got a couple minutes. I want you to do one more effect yeah. for us. In my life, and I've worked with magicians. I've, I've been in troops that magicians would work with, with me on stage. I have never asked how they do it. I don't want to know. 
Right. And unless I was That's going good. to do it, I mean, become uh, with your talent, I just don't want to know. I want that to be there. Mm -hmm. I want to be amazed by people like you. You know, I enjoy getting amazed. I mean, yeah. Before I even did magic, I would get real nervous watching magicians, I remember. Yeah. And I wanted them to screw up. I wanted that joy. You were with them right I there. Was, and yeah. you know, it's, it's just, I don't feel that way anymore because I'm used to it now. I do it. But I remember yeah. that feeling I had watching magicians. I had trouble watching them. Yeah. It would just get me in my stomach. You got one more for us? Okay, one more. All right. Stand up with this one. Yeah. Okay, let's see if I could do this one. I mean, we're, we're live here and I'll try to wing this one off. This is, I'm going to do something with these three ropes. It's something familiar, but different. These are actually my favorite ropes. <laughs> I had them ever since they were strings. <laughs> actually, it's not the ropes that I'm fond of. It's the? The hemp. I see. I'm only kidding, it's not the I hemp. I see, I saw you get those coins up the nose. <coughs> but I, what, what I really like is the flashbacks. <laughs> hey, they're free and legal. This is true. I'm still healing from the 60s. Yeah. You yeah. too, huh? Yeah, a little bit. So, but you know, I don't, get, I don't get as many flashbacks as they said I was gonna get. Why is that? I don't know, maybe I'm something wrong with me. But I'm sure it's gonna be covered on a new health plan. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love that banter. I'm, I'm gonna just show you this effect. It's kind of subtle. It's with my three ropes. Okay, you gotta watch now, watch this. Watch. <laughs> That's a teaser. Yeah, I got teased. Me too, watch. Yeah. Look at that. They linked. Yeah. These are ropes tied together that just linked. Yeah, it's, it's just the way it does it. I haven't any idea. I have one more. The two of them were not bad, but the last one, look at this. It's right there. Not bad for an I'm hippie. impressed. Not bad at all. Well, let's see if we can get them apart now. Watch this. But getting my parts a little harder because you gotta just kind of. <laughs> Look at that, there's one. I'm half a foot from this and I can't tell. Yeah, that's the problem. This is amazing. Watch this. Bravo, bravo. My new three rope trick. Excellent. Yes. Magical, mystical Michael, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hope you come back to town. Oh, I'm trying to uh, get something set up for the winter or whatever. All right. But I'd love, love to, to come see back. you here in Minneapolis. Minnesota is a, a good city for me. Michael, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Um, we're going to be back in just a moment with uh, Janet. We're going to talk about uh, a new gimmick, a new call-in gimmick. We want to know if you're watching the show. So Janet will be back in a moment, but first take a look at this. Now, we really do want to know if people are watching the show. Isn't that right? We really want to so know. So we've, we've been doing the question for the last few months, and if you knew the answer. And some people have done this and won mm -hmm. fabulous prizes. That's right. Well, now, just read that screen. Whoever sends in, calls in their address the furthest away from this building that we tape the show in, Minneapolis City Hall, wins a fabulous prize. We won't tell you what it is. Uh-uh. It's fabulous. Though. Yeah. Trust it's us. It's sort of, it's incredible. <laughs> That's what it is. Oh. Wow. Phew. Okay. I would like that. <laughs> now, if you've had any questions about what you've seen on tonight's show, you want to see more about these people, learn more about them, call the hotline here at City Cable 34 673 2234. Somebody will answer you. Mm -hmm. And next month, you can look for the scoop on the next big music event in town, the Minneapolis Music Expo, with event master planner Pete Rhodes and Ann Nesby from The Sounds of Blackness. Thanks for watching. I'm Phil Lindsay. And I'm Janet Zahn. Bye. I it? hear Ann Nesby is like the next Aretha, Aretha Franklin. Franklin. Yeah. yeah. Are they still on us and doing the credit thing? They usually try and do that. I know. Yeah. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> if people knew what was in there. I know.